so my name is Grace Kitzmiller. I'm really excited to be here talking to you with you today at the HOT Summit. I am the Senior Product Manager for the AWS Disaster Response Program. And and I'm totally slacking off and not putting my mic on yet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Visneski. I am the Principal Technical Program Manager for AWS Disaster Response. Uh, so in this session today, we will um, spend a little bit of time talking about how the cloud can enable disaster resilience, uh, and also how we can use uh, leverage AWS technology and services in order to help uh, organizations that are responding to disasters overcome some of the greatest technical and in infrastructure challenges that they face. We'll also spend a little bit of time talking about some use cases um, where the cloud is already being used to help with disaster response. And those use cases range from things like damage assessment for natural man-made disasters, processing drone imagery in the field, and even things such as supporting hurricane wind speed analysis. But before we get into those use cases, just want to tell you a little bit about the AWS Disaster Response Program. This program was launched in uh, August of 2018, uh, really to help facilitate nonprofit organization, government agency, um, NPOs, NGOs, and other similar organizations in thinking a little bit differently about disaster response and across the disaster life cycle. Uh, the program's initial focus is on um, disaster preparing for and responding to disasters and how the cloud can can really help be a force multiplier across those processes. Um, we directly support rebuilding connectivity and also leveraging cloud computing um, technologies at the edge. So think compute at the edge and disconnected, intermittently connected, or you know, no connectivity environments where the internet is just down. But in order to do that, that involves interacting with responding organizations prior to when a disaster occurs to really think about you know, what are those most critical data sets? What are those data sets that um, can have a biggest impact on response and that you'd like to prepare to have available to you when you're out in the field? Also, what are the solutions, you know, be it visualization, analysis, or other, that, again, are really critical to advancing situational awareness, developing common operating pictures on the ground, and then also to develop any deployment um, agreements uh, as appropriate. The last thing that we're doing is we're really working as we dive into this, uh, we're really trying to work backwards from you know, the people on the front line, the organizations on the front line with disasters to really better understand the entire life cycle and to really help facilitate that process of thinking about how the cloud and compute at the edge can really be a force multiplier across the disaster life cycle. Uh, so this next slide is actually really a jumping off point for that kind of conversation. This slide really talks about, you know, the art of the possible um, in disaster response. And this is what it shows. Now this uh, starts off with, if you can see this, where it says compute and storage. I don't think I have a pointer here. Let's see. Okay, maybe I have a pointer. No. <laughs> okay, no pointer. Um, but there's something in the middle there called a snowball device. Um, and this is a way you can think about bringing a little bit of the cloud with you into the field. Um, so Anna's going to talk a little bit more about exactly what that is. But just think if you had um, you know, high power compute and storage available to you while you're in the field, what could you do with that? Maybe you would bring some pre-disaster imagery with you. Maybe you would loan, uh, load, preload some machine learning models. Maybe you would preload some of those other critical data sets, say something as simple as DMV data, so that if you've had an evacuation scenario and now residents are trying to come back in, how do you identify who's actually a resident? People may have left in a rush. They might not have their driver's license or identification with them. Working out uh, to the right side of the image there, uh, having something like a, a snowball device and hooking it up to a local Wi-Fi maybe setting up some access points so that now you can start to create a local connectivity. So if you're, say, flying drones in the field or you have um, folks with you know, laptops or computers that can connect into that local network, now you can start to enrich the data that you have on this device. You can start to maybe collect imagery from the field, push it back onto this device via that, that local connectivity, and run some machine learning models, start to do damage assessment to try and um, really update that common operating picture. You can also be sure that 
you know, those responders that have the greatest need are the ones that get access to that connectivity first, right? So you can start with fire and police. Then as, um, as you start to, to push out in widening circles, you know, eventually maybe some of that could be made available to the community. Now looking over to the left, eventually your satellite backhaul will come in. Uh, you'll have additional uh, connectivity or maybe even intermittent connectivity. Now you can start to think about how do I take that enriched data that's been collected in the field or those analyses that have been completed in the field and push it back up to the cloud so that your remote operating center or your headquarters operating center now has access to that same information uh, that was collected in the field. And these are some of the ways in that you know, we're really um, thinking and you know, just working across the DR community to um, you know, dive deep on understanding you know, what those requirements are and what would help make the most difference in providing the most up-to-date information in, during a disaster. And now I'm going to turn it over to Anna to talk a little bit more about the program. Yeah, so basically what our program does is we combine uh, the capabilities of our people, our information, and our technologies to leverage all of those to improve disaster response. Um, so when you're talking about our people, uh, you'll see a little bit later too, uh, we have a team called uh, D the Disaster Response Action Team and a Remote Response Team. Uh, information is things like today, sharing the information, making sure that it's available, um, connecting people with uh, the possibilities and capabilities, use cases, because a lot of times a problem you might be having or something you might be working on is something someone else has already worked on, so we do as much information sharing as possible. And the last one is obviously the technologies. Uh, to date, uh, AWS has over 168 services, um, and so we do our best to find new and creative ways to apply those to disaster response. Oops, yeah, this one. <laughs> So these are the two teams I was just talking about, the disaster response team and the remote response team. Um, the disaster response team are the team members that we actually deploy into the field. We currently have a couple people down in the Bahamas helping there. Um, we've sent people to the California fires. Uh, we help reestablish connectivity. Uh, we hand carry the Snowball Edge device, which you'll see shortly. Um, and, and we're there in the field to basically help people um, get their connectivity back or uh, stand up the Snowball Edge to, to get it working in the field. Uh, the remote response team is um, the rest of our volunteers. So a lot of times you'll have volunteers that really want to do something but aren't necessarily trained to be in the field and would actually put first responders in more trouble in the field because they're not trained. And so what we let them do and what they help us with is they help us um, do things like uh, augment call lines. So during Hurricane Florence, for example, we, we used Amazon Connect. Uh, which is our call center service, and we help the Red Cross augment their ability to answer calls. So about 200 volunteers throughout the world, um, from you know Europe to Singapore, the United States, all of it, they got online, they took a, um, a training from the Red Cross, and then using Amazon Connect, they were able to answer phone calls coming in from those impacted by the storm to help them find the closest Red Cross resources and to answer questions and make sure that people were okay. So we're going to kind of get a little bit more into um, the technology aspect of what we're doing. Um, so with this one, what's interesting is um, when you're doing like the hurricane mapping, traditionally it's been done with the Dvorak technique, which is very manual. It's looking at the shape, the size, the speed of the hurricane and predicting what you think is going to come next. But basically what... Um, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and Development Seed did uh, with deep learning based hurricane intensifying estimator. So basically what they did was they used machine learning um, using uh, AWS uh, cloud capabilities and some of our machine learning technologies. And essentially what they've done is they've shortened the time from three to six hours to predict where a hurricane is going and how big it is to estimate the wind speed every 15 minutes. Um, it uses the infrared imagery as input, and it uses uh, near real-time images, which, is, which has changed a lot. And as you can imagine, the faster you can predict where a hurricane's gonna go and how strong it's gonna be, the better you can respond to it, the better you can plan evacuation routes, the better you can tell where you should be sending your assets. So that's one that's actually, that was actually already being used uh, for Dorian in this hurricane season. 
I just changed it on my laptop instead of on the screen. Hmm. All right. So um, another thing, satellite data. So um, whenever you're in a disaster, uh, before I joined AWS, I was in the United States Coast Guard, uh, and I was a first responder there. And one of the problems we always had was knowing where to go as fast as possible when you had a mass city incident. So what this does, um, the satellite data and some of the processing we're able to do, um, we can rapidly increase the pace by which first responders have a common operating picture and we're able to overlay the satellite images with maps. So what you can see on the left is the before and after of the California wildfires. And that way, when you can see a picture like that as quickly as possible, then first responders know where the most damage is, where they might need be more needed than in other locations. So um, what's also kind of neat about the capabilities with the satellite imagery is a lot of this processing can actually be done on our Snowball Edge device. The Snowball Edge device, um, we, we still have a picture of it in here, right? Okay, cool. You'll see it in a little bit, but the, it's literally the size of a carry-on suitcase. It weighs 50 pounds. Uh, one of the parameters for it was you have to be able to have one person able to pick it up. So they kept it pretty small. Um, and it is incredibly durable. Um, it actually can survive uh, explosions, fire, um, it's water resistant, we're working on waterproof, um, but there's, it's, it's an incredibly durable device. And the new Snowball Edge optimized for compute, which was announced at last year's reInvent, can actually do a lot of this processing on site, meaning when you're in the thing we call the last mile, that last little bit where there's no connectivity in a disaster zone, you can still get the processing power without having to worry about uh, satellites or, or any sort of connectivity. On the right there, what you see is, um, is using maps and satellite imagery to help eradicate disease. Uh, what these maps have been used for and what this process has been is that basically um, by having these satellites and, and making sure responders know where these villages are and mapping them out appropriately and, and rapidly um, assigning designations to buildings, then people who are bringing in medication know where to go. Um, and they can have that in the palm of their hand instead of having to try and figure it out off of paper when things might have changed within a day. Property damage uh, assessments. So um, we're using some deep learning models right now to try and evaluate property damage. For example, one Grace and I were talking about the other day is looking at um, using machine learning to figure out how high uh, water damage was in an area based on information from land height, water depth, and markings on buildings. Um, when you have markings on buildings that are at a certain level and you have the information from a city that say these buildings were built in this time frame, you can actually use machine learning to start predicting which buildings are likely to collapse. Um, because different buildings built at different time periods were built to withstand different types of disasters. Um, and so this kind of mapping allows us to figure out where the damage is gonna be most heavy and where we're likely to see uh, the ripple effect. The ripple effect actually can cause just as much if not more loss of life over the long term because of um, homes being damaged, water being damaged over time, um, pipeline issues, things like that. So machine learning allows us to start predicting where that damage is going to be and where it's probably going to have the most impact. So these are the devices I've been talking about. Oh, is that still me? <laughs> Just wave at me when I'm done. Um, <laughs> so what you can see there is the snowball. So the snowball essentially was originally created to help customers get into the cloud. A lot of times customers had so much data that trying to get it into the cloud through just standard internet lines would take a very long time. And sometimes there's concerns about the potential encryption capabilities from your place of business to the cloud. Once you're in the cloud, you're fine, but that line in between, customers were having concerns. So what they did was they started the Snowball. Snowball um, is that device that we send to you, it's fully encrypted, you load your data into it, we get it back, and we put the information into the cloud. Once that had been around for a little bit, we started getting some questions from customers on, could we make it do more? So we did. So now there's the Snowball Edge, which has compute capabilities. 
that's the device that where that's kind of our happy place um, because that allows us to take some of our computing capabilities, some of our machine learning algorithms, all of that, and put them out into the field even when there's no connectivity. <clears throat> and the last one is the AWS snowmobile. That's literally a semi truck. Um, that, that vehicle is uh, currently only available in the United States, uh, but it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, vehicle when you get a chance to see one. Um, they literally pull it up to your building and, uh, and download a lot. Um, but one, one, uh, one use case, and I can't necessarily say who it was, but there was one use case where literally it would have taken them six years to get all of their data from their building to the cloud. And this way we did it in a week. And that was including driving time. So we don't tend to use the snowball or the snowmobile very often in disasters. As you can imagine, it's kind of hard to get a truck in. But the nice thing about the snowball edge is literally it's, it's light enough that you can put it on a plane or a helicopter and still get it into a location. There we go. I have no idea what happened to that slide. All right. <laughs> So as you can see, it's tamper resistant. Um, there's actually a really cool piece on CNBC about the snowball where they literally do an explosion test with it. Um, and the percussion from the explosion doesn't phase it at all. Um, it's got data secured with military grade encryption. It handles up to 200 G of impact. Uh, when they say it is airdrop able, they have in fact dropped it out of the back of planes. Um, I got to drop one out the window of a six story building. Um, and you know, even though you know it's really sturdy, I had that moment of, oh no, what am I doing? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty incredible device, especially for what we do. We are also working right now on a technology that will allow this to stand up a uh, localized Wi-Fi mesh. So that not only would you be able to do the capabilities here, but you could actually have a drone, for example, feeding information directly in to the snowball, and then you'd be able to see it on a tablet in your hands, what the drone was seeing with machine learning algorithms to tell you, hey, I see a fire, hey, I see a car, hey, I see people. So these are the things that we're working on uh, to make sure that even if you can't have connectivity to the cloud, you can still have a lot of our technology. So information technology, Snowball Edge capabilities, Amazon EC2, Amazon S3, so EC2 does the compute, S3 is our buckets where you put all your data, and then Lambda. Um, and this is what allows us to do things like running um, SageMaker, which is our machine learning technology. SageMaker Neo can run on a Snowball Edge, meaning that um, one of the projects I'm working on is uh, translation capabilities in your hand. So we have a product called Amazon Translate, and we're working on building a, um, a version of it where you basically, if you know that you're deploying to uh, Vietnam and no one on your team speaks Vietnamese, you'd actually be able to take a light version of Translate with you. It already exists, we're just working on getting it on at the snowball, but you'd be able to actually have Amazon Translate go with you when you go into the field. And um, I, <laughs> this one's kind of interesting. Um, this is an, actually a use case of something we did recently. If you uh, saw in the news that Hawaii was having some volcano eruption issues, uh, USGS actually had one of their offices in the path of the lava flow. And all of their data was stored locally in that building. So the lava, they, the, the volcano they were there monitoring was literally about to lose its data because the volcano, the lava was coming towards them. So what we did was we, um, you can see uh, on the left there, uh, the device that's kind of lit up, that's a snowball. We flew a snowball down to them, got all of their data out, and got the data out of the building and up into the cloud before there was any disruption. Now you can't necessarily do that for something like an earthquake or sudden things, but when you have something coming, like a hurricane where you've got about a week or you know that something's coming, we can, we can help with that too. And I'm going to now turn it back over to Grace. And get out of your way. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. All right, uh, so what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about something one of our AWS customers has built that really pulls together all of these pieces, pulls together the snowball, pulls together thinking about what data and applications you might need beforehand, 
Um, how do you go about provisioning all of those resources onto the snowball? And then what can you do in the field? Um, and this company is called Element 84. You can look them up online, find out some more detail about their product. It's called Headlamp. And I uh, seem to have cut off the P. <laughs> it's not Headlamp, it's Headlamp. Um, and, um, you know, just, it's just a really great example of, you know, an implementation of that Art of the Possible slide. Um, so does any, uh, Anna just mentioned the California wildfires. I'm sure some folks have a recollection of those wildfires from last year. Um, so Element 84 had the opportunity to dive deep with one of the search and rescue responders in the field in Butte County in California. Um, now this, uh, the person's name is Trevor Skaggs, and um, he recalls that his pager went off at 7 a.m. on November 8th, 2018. He was on a conference call. He didn't pick up his pager. He figured, oh, you know, this call's gonna end. We'll be fine. <laughs> An hour later, um, when he got off the call, um, he checked every sort of messaging platform that he was able to be reached by and, and saw the messages. The fire is everywhere. Like, it's everywhere. And um, what happened um, in the first three hours, um, 500 acres were burned. And that's that first kind of red, red zone on the map there. Um, within 24 hours, 70,000 acres were burned. Um, and just to give you an idea of what that really means, uh, the District of Columbia in the U.S. is about 43,000 acres, and that little purple inset is the size of the District of Columbia. So basically, in the first day, that wildfire essentially burned um, land, mat, land coverage far in excess of what the entire District of Columbia in D.C. holds. Now, some people might think that's a good idea, <laughs> but um, we, won't, we, won't, we won't get into that. Um, now, it turns out that Trevor actually has a geospatial background. So later, you know, 7 a.m., you know, seeing all of these, um, you know, messages coming through, hearing about, you know, how the wildfire is progressing, um, knowing that there are other sources of information about, you know, where, the, where fires are. You know, there are different resources that you can um, access via API to, to find out the locations. Um, so he started, he, he kind of took off his search and rescue hat and put on his GIS hat. And he started to create some, some maps. And he started to really think about what are all the pieces of data that we could pull together to help you know, get this you know, fast moving disaster and get this information into the hands of the people that need it the most and get it, get it there most quickly. So. So through that conversation that Element 84 had, walking through that entire um, wildfire, wildfire scenario, you know, with Trevor, with others that were on the ground at the time, um, they came up with this really interesting um, data pipeline for field processing and for, you know, really thinking about um, what is the life cycle of, you know, this was a, a very fast-moving disaster, but, you know, what is that, you know, preparation through response life cycle that could really help uh, get that information where it needs to be faster um, so that there's just better information for, for folks to make their decisions. So first, um, you know, the first thing is, you know, there's an event trigger. You know, how, how are you um, learning about the event trigger? And we'll go through these one by, go through these one by one. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, if you're in an earthquake zone, the event trigger could be something like, uh, you know, earthquake um, signals. In a flood zone, you know, many areas now have flood, you know, IoT sensors that are out there detecting um, water levels in different areas. Um, you know, for fire, there are, you know, different um, uh, APIs that you can subscribe to to, to get fire information. Uh, and so the first thing is, you know, what is that event trigger that you're looking at? Um, also, those triggers can be human, right? It's not, it's not only automation, but it's really thinking smart about how can you add automation into this process. Uh, the next piece, gathering your tools and data. And this doesn't actually have to happen exactly in this flow, right? If you know that your focus is on hurricanes or your focus is on um, mudslides or your focus is on earthquake, you know, this is where you can think, okay, I'm responsible for, you know, this area, these five states, um, you know, Florida Panhandle, um, you know, Caribbean, um, things like what kind of um, geospatial data might it be good to have? 
And if you're thinking about pre-disaster imagery, you don't actually need yesterday's pre-disaster imagery, right? You're probably good refreshing it. You know, I don't know. Think about how frequently things change, right? What's that right level? So it could be a month ago, it could be a week ago. Um, then, you know, also think about, you know, what kind of, like, machine learning algorithm or, process, um, or um, you know, training models, training data, algorithms you might want to develop before the disaster occurs. Are you interested in damage assessment? Are there some algorithms and models out there that you could pull down and have ready to go um, and ready to run? You know, something you could train your staff on even before the event happens. You know, having those, having those kinds of things together. So that's the, you know, gathering tools and data. Um, this shameless plug for all the open data available on AWS related to geospatial imagery, um, if you go to this link, you'll see it's actually a lot more than just the geospatial data. Um, you know, there's, there's of course, there's map tiles, there's Landsat, there's Sentinel, there's OpenStreetMaps. <laughs> um, you know, quite a bit of information that, you know, again, as you're thinking about, you know, what are those critical data sets that I might need access to? Um, or that I want to prepare to be able to use. Um, it's a good place to go to find some of those resources. Okay, uh, and then I just want to dive into this machine learning um, at the edge and, you know, kind of bringing it back a little bit to Element 84. So one of the things they've done with their headlamp product is they have, you know, kind of pulled, they've created a model where, you know, there is the ability to pull this um, pre-disaster imagery ahead of time, um, but then also think about, you know, um, pulling together those different kinds of machine learning models um, so that you can do inference on the edge, either on a snowball or in the cloud, right? So you might have a, you know, kind of a co-deployment model that you use, right? If you, um, maybe you want to think about running it in the cloud, you can do some simulations even beforehand, just running, running this pipeline in the cloud um, so that you're ready when you go out into, you know, when that disaster occurs and you need to go out into the field, you know, the, there will always be surprises, <laughs> so I won't say there will be no surprises, uh, but you'll be a lot better prepared. Um, next, really think about what your interfaces are. You know, what, what visualization tools do you want to use? Oops. Um, you know, think about, um, you know, pulling that into your pipeline. You know, again, it could, it will, it will be context specific. It will depend on the kind of disaster damage assessment, I think, is a common um, requirement across many of these. Um, but once you've taken the time to go through this first part of the workflow, where you've you know, thought about what, what data you're going to need, um, what models you might need, what visualization tools you want to use, now you can do something in the cloud called build an AMI, which is an Amazon machine image. And that's really a, you know, sort of self-contained version of that, you know, pipeline of data and tools that you might need. And once you have that AMI created, now you can provision it onto your Snowball device, um, along with, you know, any data that you might want. So uh, Anna men mentioned that a Snowball has EC2 on it. It also has S3 on it. So the Snowball device with compute at the edge, um, it has uh, 80 terabytes of storage. So you can store a lot of data on there. And you can actually store a lot of enriching data on there if you've got imagery you're collecting in the field, either by people driving around or flying drones or through whatever source. Or if you're downloading um, you know, satellite imagery, right? If you've got a telecom that's in there with you and they've given you some satellite backhaul and you're able to you know, get enough connectivity to download some updated imagery. Um, so once you have those packages together, um, you provision the Snowball device, and then you can very quickly get it delivered out into the field. And that's where either, um, you know, if, if we've had the opportunity to talk with you beforehand, facilitate that, um, or, you know, you're able to order it just from the console. It's actually really interesting. If, if anybody here has an AWS account, you can log in, search for Snowball, and you can just pick and choose <laughs> what you want. Um, and, you know, there is a, um, some shipping time that has to happen. But in the event of a disaster where a faster delivery is needed, you know, there are always escalation paths to make sure it can come out quick, it can get through more quickly. Uh, and uh, I think I just talked through this. So again, this is really just, you know, all about provisioning it and deploying your snowball edge. So, you know, then what happens once you're in the field? Again, this is where all your new data are coming in. Think about, you know, that, that back half of the art of the possible slide. 
um, once your connectivity is restored, you're able to push all that data back. Um, what we've also seen people do is actually keep um, two of these snowball devices, maybe a storage one and a compute optimized one, so that rather than um, necessarily waiting for connectivity, you know, sometimes connectivity is not too far away, right? It's far enough away to, to cause challenges, but it's not too far away. So sometimes you can transfer data from, you know, say, the compute optimized device down to just a storage optimized device. Somebody just picks it up and takes it in a car and drives two hours away. Um, and then it's much easier to, to get that information back. Um, and it can be, get it back into the cloud. Um, and then if you have that same stack already running um, in the cloud as well, now you can just suck all that data in. And now your remote offices have that same common operating picture as you do in the field. And so um, if you actually, if you do have an opportunity to search up um, Element 84's headlamp product, they have a nice video that actually has a sort of an animated view of, of, of how they've, they're actually, what they're doing in that video is doing a replay of the wildfire event. Um, and, you know, they're looking to, to do some implementations um, in real time soon. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Anna for one last time. Maybe? Okay, there we go. <laughs> I forgot I was doing this one. Um, so what you can see here is you're actually seeing what we did down in Peru with some drones. Uh, we work with We Robotics. Um, they've been using drones to try and work on humanitarian aid for a while. Uh, so they had some problems. One of them was the effect effective coordination of the teams of drone pilots. So what can happen in some of these disaster areas is you have a whole bunch of different organizations coming in from different places and they all have their drones. And since drones are relatively new technology, they're not necessarily talking to each other. And so you start finding drones crossing paths, uh, frequency issues, collision issues, things like that. Um, and then also without internet, there's some data issues as well. Um, the other thing is, is that some of these drones bring in so much data so fast that rapidly uh, analyzing it can be complicated. And that's why we actually ended up getting involved was to help them with the actual data processing using, as you can see again, the Snowball Edge. Solution was obviously the storage optimized Snowball Edge. Uh, we deployed it uh, and basically, as, as um, Grace was saying, one of the big things is, and this kind of go is true no matter what you're talking about for a disaster, uh, preparing. So thinking ahead and thinking about what you would need if it happened and getting those algorithms and getting the data, as much data together before the incident happens so that when you're pulling in new data, you have something to compare it to. So um, we actually worked down in uh, Peru. Uh, and as you can see, we were mapping out a river area that had flooded. Um, so what you're seeing there is like that yellow uh, is some of the highly flooded area with a village. And then the blue is a little bit, um, is also areas that had flooded, but they weren't as uh, impacted as the yellow areas. Um, so this kind of brings us back to uh, what we were talking about with the art of the possible, is that we're going to be doing a few more of these with We Robotics, Esri, and some others, where we're gonna go into different regions, um, hot and cold. Um, so we're gonna be doing tropic, subtropic, ar uh, and then subarctic areas. Uh, to continue testing drone capabilities, um, overlaying drone imagery in real time over the top of maps, uh, as well as using drones to start doing uh, better search and rescue uh, capabilities. So image recognition using the machine learning algorithms that we're training to look for objects and people. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to be kind of on this forward edge of taking drone technology maps and then the snowball devices into areas where before getting a common operating picture, especially when it came to locations that are remote, uh, was really hard before and, and now we're finding ways to actually make it accessible and a little bit easier. So that is the tail end there. Uh, and now we can take any questions. Got about five minutes. And I have my cards too that I'm happy to give out. So if you don't think of a question now, but you think of a question in a couple days, you can go ahead and email me. Or Grace. So, oh, thank yep. you. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned the uh, different forecast 
So NOAA, NASA, and a few others have been collaborating on it. Um, and it was basically to uh, increase the, they used a machine learning model to increase the predict predictability of the wind speeds. Yeah, and this is an example where, um, you know, AWS wasn't really involved in that activity uh, in, a, in a really significant way. You know, these groups we provided the together. Tech. Just, yeah. You know, they're working together, um, you know, uh, thinking about having a three to six hour update on those wind speed analysis, you know, the, the group at NASA and Development Seed, you know, really pulled together to work with the Hurricane Center using some other tool, open source tools that um, NASA, had, I'm sorry, the Hurricane Center had already developed mm -hmm. in order to just try to automate that model, right? Yep. They, they knew it was too manual, they knew it wasn't running fast enough, and, you know, that was a collaboration between those three groups. A great way to look at what AWS does is we provide the Lego. Um, we have the tools, we have the, the components, and a lot of times com groups like NASA will take those components, our services, and, and build out a really cool new solution to something. Um, what our team does largely is helps enable that. So um, the team largely has a, a humanitarian aid or disaster response background, like I'm from the Coast Guard. Uh, we've got some people from UNICEF on the, that used to work for UNICEF on the team. And so we take our expertise in disaster response plus our expertise with AWS, and we help different nonprofits and, and companies um, come up with solutions. So, so it's a lot of, it's, it's an interesting project, but that's how we work with, with groups like that. And that's why what Grace is talking about is like, we handed them the tools and they're like, okay, we built a great thing, so. Yeah, and for really, as Anna said, for everyone in the room, we're happy to, if you have some ideas, if you have some things you're, you know, some of those what ifs that you're asking yourself, you know, we'd love to engage with you to help you think about, you know, are there ways that, you know, the cloud could really help with that um, or, you know, could, could make a difference in that mm -hmm. area. So, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to us. I think our emails are in the program somewhere as well. Yeah. And then, as I said, I have my cards with me. Always happy to talk to you about projects you might be working on or, or ideas you have to see if it's possible. Or if it's not, the other thing is, is then we go back to the teams and say, why isn't it possible and can we make it possible? So, all right, if there are no more questions. Awesome, thank you, everyone. Thank you.